episode 342 of Global From Asia. And the URL, globalfromasia.com slash Asia dash future. Let's do this. Talking about the future of Asia. Is it the place to be or not? Welcome to the Global From Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now your host, Michael Michelini. All right, everybody, thank you so much for choosing to download and listen and watch or whatever you do. You know, maybe you're reading a transcript of globalfromasia.com slash Asia dash future. <laughs> 342 shows every other week. I kind of feel a little bit re-inspired, you know. Um, this whole lockdown is driving me crazy. We can't even get things delivered here from other places cities in within china like my wife loves buying on these taobao sites and everything but delivery people don't even come here so it's uh it's really nuts so like we have to find local delivery now they um at least i'm not doing a covid test twice a week right now it's <laughs> at least let's keep open and uh you know i'm just uh, excited to share with you this week's show we have a great guest i uh, i read his articles he's got books he's got lots of resources he is based in singapore Paragana, and he has some really amazing insights it gets me re-inspired too about being in asia being based doing business cross-border trade you know is this the right place to be this conversation uh so so it's obviously a little bit biased but we talk about and he talks about reasons why the war for talent you know the up the rising of of developing countries in asia things like that it's pretty cool i i, I learned a few things and it got me re-inspired so definitely check out the show we will go through this as is a is a in a great way also, this was done in audio only, so we will just have the image here. But, you know, hopefully you can enjoy that if you're watching this on YouTube. We'll still put it up there, I think. And let's. And after the show, I'll talk a little bit about the mastermind we did this past week. And then we will talk about some of my plans in Asia for the next few years, once we, if we ever get out of this lockdown. So without further ado, let's tune into the show. Are you building an Amazon business or a B2B trade business? A lot of people registering in the US right now and they're not there. They're not there. They're not Americans. They're not, but they're doing it because it's, uh, it's, it's easy and there's different options and they're getting their Amazon accounts, but they're having trouble with banking. We have a really high ranking blog post about getting banks for non US citizens and we're really happy to be partnered with Mercury.com. They will be on our next podcast as well, where you can talk to one of the team members there with me, but we also give you a cash bonus on certain conditions, as well as we get a little bit of benefit too at globalfromasia.com slash mercury, or our full review with a video tutorial that I made at globalfromasia.com slash reviews slash mercury. Thanks again, Mercury. And if you enjoy the show and want to support, sign up with that link and I thank you in advance. See you soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Mike Michelini here at the Global From Asia podcast. And the topic today and the guest today is, is very suitable, actually. He's recommended by a listener, Parag Khanna. Parag is the leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. He's the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. He's also just released one of his newer books, the future is Asian, commerce, conflict, and culture in the 21st century. And he's also an author of many other books, very relevant to you know what's happening in the world. And uh, he's contributed great articles. And it's really a pleasure to have Parag with us on the show today. Thanks for being here. Great to speak with you, Mike. Yeah, I, you know, I'm really happy. I mean, our show name is Global from Asia. We started this in 2013, actually, the, as a as an audio podcast, you know, about Hong Kong. Originally, it was purely more around Hong Kong business structure, and then we've we've grown we've grown into cross border trade and and e commerce from Asia. So I think what you have to sh you know what we we'll discuss today is very relevant to our audience of of business owners doing cross border trade. So. You know, I think like, you know, you, you, the theme of what you've talked about in, in your, a lot of your articles and your books is the future is, future is Asia, right? I mean, I think that's, that's what we're about here and that's what we see and especially as accelerated, I think the last one or two years, I think 
I think a lot was with the trade war and like Im- immigration, right? I think a lot what you're talking about is is America was built on immigrants, right? I mean, even I'm I'm an American born Italian American, you know, I Italian and French Russian and Canadian, if you believe it. So we're all, most Americans are immigrants, but nowadays it seems like walls are, walls are going up, right? I mean, that's, that's basically the theme of what's happening. Well, that's part of it. I mean, in terms of just demographics, leaving aside immigration as such, obviously the present is very Asian, not just the future, because half the world population lives in Asia. And that's the gap between Asia and the rest of the world will only grow because Asia's population continues to grow while you have demographic stagnation in the West. And you actually have a pretty steep drop off in fertility in the Arab world as well. Much of the Arab world, by the way, is in geographic Asia. We can come back to that later. When it comes to immigration, most Asians travel and do business and are tourists and migrate within Asia. But of course, Western societies have benefited massively from Asian immigration. After the, if you take the United, if you take Great Britain, of course, which has a sizable South Asian population, that really ramped up after the independence of India and Pakistan in the in late 1940s. In the United States, it was the it was the the Immigration Act, 1965, that opened the door to waves of Chinese and Indian migrants. My family moved to America in 1983 when I was a kid, so I'm myself an immigrant to the United States. And over the last you know 35 years, I've watched you know the the South Asian population of the United States absolutely balloon. You have roughly three million Chinese Americans today, three million Indian Americans and obviously many, many other Asian populations. Of course, you know, you know, you, you know all the headline stats about the percentage of Silicon Valley that is, you know, run by, you know, found, startup founders who are, who are Asian. Of course, the medical profession, you know, pharmaceutical, you know, you name it. So many business uh, sectors really depend on those immigrants. So the question, you know, that I've been raising or that I raised in that book, but it's much more a theme of my future work is the kind of war for talent because we actually have a finite human population and you know a finite number of livable desirable places both politically and economically socially environmentally and i the question i've been raising lately is well where are those people going to go are the is the flow still from east to west and what i found and this is the a term that i used in in the asia book i called it american asian so i grew up as an asian american and the term american asian doesn't exist i i coined it and i coined it because i'm an american who moved back to asia and I was like, wait a minute, I'm not an Asian American anymore. I'm an American Asian. And what I found here in Singapore and Hong Kong and all across the region, even Indonesia, Vietnam, is throngs of Asian Americans who have never lived in Asia. They were really born and raised in the U.S. like, like you. And they're mo- they moved here for the first time because it's become the land of opportunity because of China's growth, because of innovation across the region, fast growing markets, all of these reasons of quality of life, adventure, you know, uh, high salaries, whatever the case may be, have lured so many, you know, created a whole new cast of American Asians here in the region. That's something that I do do deal with in the book. Okay. I like that American Asian. I think that's me huh? <laughs> and you. Yeah. No. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my quick story, you know, I think listeners know, I, <clears throat> I I moved here in 2007 to China because of the sourcing from factories and e-commerce and didn't think I would still be here, but married with kids now, a Chinese wife uh-huh. and five-year-old and seven-year-old and still here. But yeah, it's just, uh, there's more and more of us for sure. I mean, just like with this, with this show and with what you're doing it, and like you said, the opportunity so you know i did want to touch a little bit about the the old way at least i considered it like you said the 1940s and uk 1965 and in the us it's interesting to have those dates i didn't have the dates before but yeah like you said that used to be east going to west right like asia moving to america or or the uk or the western world but i think that they are starting to want to stop that right i mean i i talked a lot of even overseas students you know overseas you know like we mentioned silicon valley but the policies and you know the walls are going up so i don't know if you want to touch on a little bit of those are pretty big headlines like you mentioned too but i don't know if you want to give us some insights of your perspective 
I would say the the key words there around walls going up, populism, protectionism, that kind of thing. You know, we we in the Anglo American media we talk about those things as if they are universal phenomena. You know, Trump and Brexit occurring in the same year. And you know, again, if they are global tidal waves, but the fact is, again, the majority of the human population, most countries of the world, most people in the world, live in societies that do not look like America and the U.S. Neither in trade policy or in politics. And yes, you have nationalism, but you have also a lot of pragmatism. You have long-term vision that governments are trying to implement. You have more technocratic governance, which is a, a theme uh, I develop in the book quite a bit when describing Asian uh, political systems because they may be democratic or they may be authoritarian. In fact, more people in Asia live in democratic countries than authoritarian ones, and I think that's very important. Obviously, for people in the West to understand that when you look at Asia, you shouldn't just see China.、Yeah. Um, Um, there are 1.4 billion people who live under a Chinese authoritarian system, and there's a couple of other authoritarian countries in the region. But the majority of Asians live in democratic countries, whether it's India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, and so on and so forth. So. Let's remember that while there's great diversity of politics in Asia, the majority is democratic, and people prefer democracy. But they also want to see again strong, far-sighted, utilitarian kinds of leaders that are sort of technocratic, as I say, with real competence and experience in governance. And if they don't see those kinds of leaders, then they'll throw them out. And that's very important as well. And I think there's a lot, obviously, to be learned from the technocratic idea from the West. It is, of course, a Western concept entirely. Whether you're talking about Plato's notion of the guardians or the constitution of the French political system in the late 19th century, you know, technocracy is basically a Western idea. You could you could say, obviously, it's a Chinese idea as well if you think about the ancient Confucian Mandarin system. For public officials, so I mean, it's it's actually kind of a, a sensible global framework in which to look at things. But just getting back to your point around politics, so you know, when we when we say walls are going up and protectionism and borders and so forth, well, obviously that's not true of the largest region of the entire world, because here they just ratified the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is the largest trade zone on the planet. So again, you know, we have to remember that we don't live in one world. It, by which you know, kind of American and British politics dictate the system to the rest. It's it's really being flipped on its head. And I started making that case, you know, about 15 years ago in my in my very first book. But、Great. this age book is kind of the time, kind of the the sort of pulling all of those threads together. Exciting times, yeah. So let's 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 focus on like the future. I mean, that's what you know you're working on now, and you're talking about the future is Asia. I mean, I'll be honest. I literally just had a phone call with a friend yesterday, just saying I should go back to the U.S. You know, it. You know, it, things are getting a little bit crazy here. You know, it's safer there. I, nah, I, I I don't know. A lot of my friends seem to think that, but I'll stick. I don't want to get too personal, but I mean, I'll just say Asia. I won't say maybe mainland China or not, but I I might have more. Outside a China plans, but you know I plan to stay in Asia. You know that's why the show is called Global from Asia. I mean, I, I I think you and I are a similar wavelength with the opportunities here. So you know, and I like the point you just brought up about a lot of people, and you know I kind of joke about myself being kind of like one of these typical Americans. Before I came here, I thought every everything was China. You know, I I didn't really understand the differences. You know, even of course I knew India was different, but you know, I think a lot of times Americans don't realize, like you just pointed out, that Asia is is much more than than China, and there's a lot of democracies there that have different systems. So you you know any and I like that point you just brought up about the opening up and the largest trade zones. So you so you're thinking a lot of people from the, The U.S. or the Western world will move here too, or you're just—is the theory more that Asia will just continue to develop independently, organically? Oh no, it's both.、Uh, you know, as I said, there's not only the sort of American Asians. There's Europeans. There's Africans. You know, I mean, you know, Arabs. There is a gravitational pull, and again, one of the big things is just circulation of people. I mean, just during this pandemic. You know, it's both quality and quantity. During this pandemic, I've witnessed now、um, nearly a dozen high net worth, you know, tech sector Americans move here with their assets, their families, and so forth, straight into Singapore. So, 
you know, those are high quality people. And again, it goes back to this war for talent is, you know, China has not only lured back hundreds of thousands of so-called sea turtles. India had been doing the same and is trying to continue to do that. You know, the sort of city states like Singapore, as I just described, Japan is becoming, you know, a popular place for expats. There's never been three million non-Japanese people living in Japan, but that's exactly the case today. And many of, you know, they come from all over the world. So I do think that Asia is a talent magnet. You know, again, many countries offer a superior quality of life. And, you know, it's a really a place to start new things. And obviously the markets are enormous and growing. And I think there's just many, many factors. So there's a traditional model where expats are sent here and they stay for a couple of years and they're pulled back. What I see today is very different. It's individuals voluntarily coming here as entrepreneurs, not being sent here by multinational employers in the West. And that's a very, very different model. And they're here for the long haul. They're taking permanent residency. They're settling down. They're investing. They're raising their families here. And it's a far larger number of Westerners doing that today than in the 70s and 80s. I would agree. I mean, I'm one of them. <laughs> so there, no. and I, do, I do talk to quite a few people. I think one of the hurdles, I'm not sure if you have any insights for, for, for parents, but you, you mentioned also families. I think that is one of the bigger challenges. A lot of times ex, the traditional expat would leave or the, well, they would have the big packages. So their big corporate companies would pay for their kids' school, you know. But I think school is one of the bigger challenges, I think, for, for foreigners in any country. I, I, I would imagine going either east to west or west to east. But I hope there's more programs for, for immigrants, you know, to Asia for, for education. You know, that's been one of the bigger challenges that myself and others I've, I've talked to. This is an interesting shift, actually, because now you do have those Western campuses that have opened up here, you know, so Yale uh, and U.S. is one example, but there's many, many others affiliated campuses of Western universities, even just uh, Asian universities that are growing in stature. I get emails from people in Europe, you know, young students in Europe saying, I really want to do my master's degree at XYZ institution in Asia. You know, can you help me with that. The, the, one of the first times I started kind of tracking this theme was when I went to lecture at Tsinghua in Beijing in their master's program of international relations. And I was expecting to see an audience of all Chinese students, but they had just launched their English language master's degree. So you, it was a very kind of, you know, diverse audience in the, in the auditorium. And I was like, wow, you know, these are American or European kids who could have done their master's degree at SIPA, at Columbia, or Georgetown, and the MSFS, or Johns Hopkins SICE, or the Harvard Kennedy School, or Princeton Woodrow Wilson School, but instead, they came to do their master's in Beijing. And that was really a kind of eye-opening thing. And that was, again, about 14 years ago, right? Now, obviously, when it comes to China, there's been a lot of volatility in the foreign student population because of COVID and you know political sensitivities and so on. But I'll actually... You know, as a reminder, this is, uh, is someone I quoted, uh, actually, a, a, a sort of a university official in China who I spoke to recently. He said that, you know, the numbers of Americans are, of course, down, right, recently, you know, other than, you know, perhaps elite programs like Schwartzman Scholars or whatever. But he said, but the, 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 the number of students from BRI countries is way up, right? And as you and I know, that stands for Belt and Road Initiative, talking about, you know, dozens and dozens of countries across maybe mostly the rest mm -hmm. of Asia, the developing world. But the number of overall foreign students in China is strong because they're coming from the rest of the world. Not, it's so the fate of Asian or Chinese higher education does not depend on whether they attract curious, you know, backpacking Americans or even young American students. Scholars. It is about training the next generation of leaders, wherever they may come from around the world, and the countries with which Asian nations have strong or, or growing relationships. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, it. As an American in China, I get these warnings from the embassy like weekly nowadays, <laughs> and it's it is pretty nerve wracking. We even I joined a webinar with the U.S. embassy about Americans in China. A I think it was around Christmas. It was a Christmas party. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely unstable times for sure these last couple of years. And we'll see what the new you know, policies in the West, in America, 
do for the future. But yeah, I would agree. It's definitely more like, you know, like BRI, Belt Road Initiative or non-US people are moving to to Asia or China. It's pretty fascinating though, the all um, English language uh, master's program in, in Beijing. It, I've seen others go there for, for Chinese language or immersion program, but that's pretty insightful. I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that it's, there's been this shift of people, Asia countries learning that Westerners or foreigners want to live in their country long-term. I think, you know, Thailand's another hotspot of, you know, digital nomads or, you know, entrepreneurs that want to spend time there. And I think they're working on longer term visa programs for these kind of digital entrepreneurs. What what kind of immigration tips or insights or, or you know, you know is, is, information would you like to share with us, you know, for people looking to make this move and follow this new trend? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I think this is pre-COVID. The pre-COVID period featured, you know, governments being more confident in wanting to attract uh, foreign investors, right? So as their passports became more globally viable, as their expat communities grew, as they searched for entrepreneurs and talent and investors, many countries, again, Thailand, Indonesia, many, many have streamlined in, in immigration, right? But not, not only to harmonize regulations amongst themselves, because that's been called for in the Asian integration process, but also obviously again to recruit to recruit global talent. So mm -hmm. Singapore, everyone, Japan has made it easier to buy property. All of these things have been underway. Then with COVID, obviously you now have this kind of you know a bump, if you will. You know you you've been reading about this in the news headlines every day. You know another country announces some kind of a global nomad visa. You know yeah, come yeah. no questions asked, stay as long as you like. You know on. Mm -hmm. Or visa, tech pass in Singapore, those are two examples. So these things are flourishing and obviously people should just pick their country, look look up the program and apply online or you know, arbitrage among them and see who gives you the best deal. You know, it's going to be low tax. It's going to be, you know, again, affordable living. It's going to be high quality of life. It's going to be sort of come and go as you please. You know, no fixed commitment. They're probably reducing the amount of capital up front that you have to invest, if any, you know, for an initial one or two year period. Because, again, this is a broader kind of macroeconomic, you know, or public policy point. But but one that I've kind of been been not preaching, but observing for a long time, which is that smart countries don't really chase tax revenue, they chase investment, right? Investment, mm -hmm. sticky. tax revenue is fleeting, you know, it comes in, goes out. But investment, you know, people planting their roots in a country, investing in property, putting their kids in schools, eating in restaurants, that kind of thing is more important you know, obviously in having companies, no, no doubt, relocate their headquarters, move their manpower, build factories and labs. That's what smart countries do, right? They're going after investment. And that's what you see happening across Asia because, you know, only the wealthiest Asian countries have very high tax rates, by which I mean, you know, sort of Japan and, and Korea. But obviously, smaller Asian countries have far lower tax rates, even wealthy ones like Singapore, you know, Malaysia is relatively modest as well. So at this point, there's 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 just you know the Pandora's box is open in terms of the various schemes by which one can move to some Asian country or the other, and I've been watching again. I've been watching this now for a, a decade, and I see people going to many different countries for many different reasons. Right? You could be going to Australia if you are trying to you know hide your money from China <laughs> or from the <laughs> Korean. Japanese tax authorities, right? You could be choosing uh, Bali, right? As you know, Bali and Phuket are growing as long-term residential enclaves and hubs. But again, even before COVID, because the cost of living in those places is much lower than Singapore, Hong Kong, I've known executives to relocate, you know, dozens and dozens of workers to those places. And what young software programmer or e-commerce, you know, manager is going to complain about being forcefully moved to Bali to do their work remotely, no one, right? So this has been going on for a while. You know, you and I are both parents, so we also look at the international schools. Yep. You know, places that never had international schools now have full-fledged international schools. Well, you know, it's not for the locals, right? It's for the growing number of expats. So again, take your pick of country, of city, of province, you know, if you prefer city or beach or whatever. And, you know, you can probably pretty much go and move there. 
Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, one thing we're thinking about doing is it's so early. I don't think maybe it's the first time we even have said it on our show is we're thinking about having a little bit of like a community, somewhat a physical community where we invite people in our community to live in that neighborhood and we can hope, hopefully support each other. I mean, I think after all this COVID lockdown, I think a lot of us want to live in vicinity so that we could uh, see other, you know, people in our kind of like our tribes, you know, it's like these village kind of thoughts as others I've talked to too, they want to kind of have these hubs of people really close to each other just for the social and the human part of of living, you know, so we're, we're looking at putting something like that together, maybe probably be over a year or so away and, you know, step by step. But that's one thing we're, we're, we're playing with as a community. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk about your books. You know, you, yeah, you've, you've, you have quite a few and we, I mentioned one in your bio and, and you have things you're working on. Do you want to, to share a little bit about, 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 about those? Well, sort of past, present, or future? I think uh, maybe the current book is The Future is Asian, you know, the commerce, conflict, and culture in the 21st That's century. Right. So, you know, that one came out last year, but, you know, again, the, some of the central arguments around Asia's economic recovery leading the world after COVID are now baked into kind of how we think about where the world economy is going. So, you know, it's as relevant as ever. The Asian sort of technocracy model, obviously, as well, looking at which governments perform the best in coping with COVID, obviously, that, that thesis is is validated, you know, and and so I've been kind of, you know, advocating, not that, you know, as I said before, yes, the rest of the world can learn. It's not that one model is better than another. You know, the central thesis is very much that Asia is a new layer of paint on a canvas. And that canvas already has European and American layers on it. And when you paint another layer, on a, on, a, on a canvas, you don't wipe out the previous colors, right? The colors blend together. And that's really what's happening in the world today. And, and obviously, it's not a short-term argument. So COVID only accelerates and strengthens the argument, but we're talking about a decades-long process. You know, every region of the world, as it rises, has its sort of moment in the sun where the stars align, where you have young populations, you have industrialization, public investment, you have innovation and, you know, education strengthening and political stability and geopolitical stability. All these stars have been aligning for the past, say, you know, 40 plus years in, in Asia, and they're going to continue to. It's not going to stop tomorrow, right? It's obviously not going to stop because of COVID. It, it quite frankly, and this is where the book is very geopolitical, it's not going to stop even if there's a war, right? You could have war over Taiwan, war in North Korea, you could have a war in the South China Sea, war between India and China. Every major World War Three scenario in in the world is in asia right so I'm, I'm hardly in denial about it i spend a lot of my time micro you know sort of studying each of those scenarios and and, and worrying about them however asia is not europe right it's not like europe in 1914 where you have a conflict in one place and there's chain reactions and escalation and the whole continent is engulfed in war asia is a hell of a lot bigger than europe and it's much more diverse and the, these conflicts are somewhat dissociated from each other. They're, they're bilateral and they're localized. So if and when you have such a, you know, sort of escalation or, or something, you know, sort of, sort of blows over, eventually you, have, you may have a conflict and you'll have a winner and you'll have a loser. You'll have a settlement and, you know, things will move on. Right. And that's kind of how history works. So there are a lot of people who say, look, you know, yeah, the Asian story seems great. But what happens when you have a war? And my answer is, so what? Right. I don't literally mean to be flippant, but I mean, you tell me if you believe that the entire Asian story of five billion people and infrastructure investment and trade and urbanization and technology and empowerment. Are you telling me that? North South Korean conflict derails the story of every other society in Asia because you have to make that case, right? I don't have to make that case. You need to prove that you think that there is a particular scenario, even Taiwan, you know, I mean, again, God forbid in each of these scenarios, but mm -hmm. you tell me how it destroys all of Asia. It doesn't. And the sad, the sad truth of, of kind of global history is that you know you wouldn't have the european union today if you hadn't had the horrors of world war one and world war ii 
right? But, you know, unfortunately, in Europe's case, you had to have the devastating conflicts and destruction and, you know, loss of population and life in order to eventually have an evolution towards the European Union. Now, in Asia, there isn't going to be an Asian Union, but you can, you know, hopefully find ways, and this is what I call technocratic peace theory instead of democratic peace theory, which is kind of an axiom of Western political science. You know, in technocratic peace theory, the Asian leaders know exactly where to draw the lines on the map in order to solve conflicts, right? They just can't do so publicly in a time when their grip on power may be considered fragile or they may be considered to be weak or appeasing if they make concessions that are above and beyond what the other side makes. So my, my approach is that there should be a technocratic piece in which you have basically secret deliberations among countries with in, independent uh, panels with you know, participation of rep represented or, or kind of stakeholder countries and they come to these agreements, you know, quiet, quietly, without the results of the agreements, you know, sort of feeding back to the head of state, such that they are the ones held responsible for the outcome. So you could, for example, have a five-year process that a leader initiates, saying, over the next five years, we're going to settle this conflict diplomatically. I may not be the one in charge of this country five years from now, but I'm initiating the process. Five years later, the person who is the leader, when those processes are complete, is not going to be the one held responsible for the outcome, but you will have a politically, uh, a peaceful settlement of disputes. So this this is the kind of approach that I would take. It, it may seem like it's just some kind of academic game, but actually this is how a number of conflicts or you know, island disputes and so forth have been settled in the past. And I definitely think it's much more appropriate for the Asian context. Well, this has really been insightful. Thank you. Thank you for these insights. And then you have a book coming, right? You want to share about what's what's coming, how people could find out more? Yeah, a brief teaser. Uh, it's called Move, uh, and it's about the future of human geography. So I'm really looking at the, the species level, you know, reorganization of human civilization in light of a climate change, in light of, you know, political disruptions, economic crises, technological automation, and focused in particular on the next 30 years, which means I'm looking at young people. Because young people, those under the age of 40, represent about you know, 55 to 60 percent of the human population. Now, old people tend to not move as much as young people. And mm -hmm. so if you want to understand the future demographics and uh, population distribution of the world, you obviously need to focus on what young people are doing. People like you, me, what we do with our children, what our children do, and so on. So I decided to look kind of from a bottom-up view at where young people are moving and why they're moving and what motivates them and what countries are doing the best job of absorbing youth. And this is a fundamentally economic and therefore also geopolitical a line of research because it's not really just about you know demographics and preferences and psychology. Fundamentally, a strong country is one that's absorbing people, right? No one thinks mm. of Russia as a superpower precisely because its demographics have collapsed. So, you know, Canada, meanwhile, is actively planning to triple its population to reach 75 or, or 100 million people in the coming decades. So the geopolitics of 50 years from now looks very different in light of climate change and migration. So I decided to take this bottom up, you know, kind of human centric view and let that story unfold to make some scenarios and forecasts around what the future economic and geopolitical landscape looks like on the basis of the necessity of mass migrations in light of all of the disturbances and disruptions today. So that's uh, that book, Move, and it's coming out in, in September of this year. Well, exciting, exciting. And then the best place, you know, I think where people can find you is your, your personal site. Parag Khanna, which will link .com, which will share in the show notes and link to the, the various things you've mentioned. And then Future Map is your your agency, FutureMap.io. Future Map is my uh, my consulting firm, my advisory firm. So we're about yeah. uh, eight partners, and we do a lot of work with governments and companies on their either building scenarios or doing kind of global strategies for them. 
Amazing. Okay. Well, I think that I know you're so busy. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us today. And it's exciting times, I think, for, for yeah, you're positioned and, and where we are in the community here and the listeners. So if you're listening to this, I hope, I hope you got some insights and took some action. And uh, it seems like, I think at least... I believe, and and Prague is saying, is Asia seems like the future. I mean, that's where the talent people are coming here. People, the, the huge populations. The trend is the trend is still here, and it, it seems like it's accelerated even more post COVID, for sure. Right? No so, question. I mean, you know, I was okay. going to call the book the as a joke. I say the book could have been called "The Present Is Asian," because the, the present already is Asian. But but yeah, I think you know, again, for for better or worse. The, 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 the thesis certainly feels like it's being validated. And it's interesting to hear you saying that, you know, irrespective of what's happening in, in Hong Kong, you know, you certainly plan to stay in the region. I think that's also uh, proof uh, of the argument. Yeah. Yeah. Although Southeast Asia looks a little bit, is pulling me a little bit more than... than uh, well, you're more than welcome down here. Yeah. <laughs> coming soon. Coming soon. All right. Thanks again, Frog. And let's uh, stay in touch. Thanks again for sharing with it. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure to speak with you. That was cool. Thank you so much, Parag. I really appreciate him coming on and sharing with us and inspiring us. You know, I think I think Asia is still the place to be. You know, I, I remember when I was evacuating Philippines to China and I got U.S. Embassy emailing me that if I don't go back to the U.S. or I was reading some kind of tweets from the State Department, state.gov, something in the U.S. And if they said, dear U.S. citizens, if you don't return to America soon there might not be an opportunity to come back for an extent i don't know for exact word extended amount of time and i'm like well this is my home my wife is here my kids are here you know my my work is here you know buying from a thailand factory partner with thailand factory selling on amazon new brand you know here in china i just had a an amazing consultation session with a, a chengdu amazon company selling company and uh, but this is where i plan to be I, that's why I named the show Global from Asia, obviously. I luckily didn't call it Global from China, although I keep coming back to China. But a little bit about my plans. Like I said in the intro, still trying to get back to Thailand. You know, I know some people tempt me about Vietnam or tempt me about, you know, uh, Malaysia. But my wife bought a car. Okay, so we got a car stuck there. And you can't even sell the car if you don't have a long-term visa. And it's even then if you have it. It's hard to do it if you're not there. So I don't want to say because we have a car, we're going back, but partnering with a factory to do a new Amazon brand, selling factory direct on Amazon. And that's been moving forward. We'll talk about that in next show, the banking solution that we use, Mercury and the experiences there. But, you know, I, I just always like the energy here and I have an amazing team, mostly in the Philippines. They're helping make these amazing shows, uh, and we are doing, you know, doing a lot of hard work here to build a long-term future. My kids are learning Chinese and English, or at least I'm their English teacher. But that's the long-term, the long-term plan. So, and I'm enjoying these masterminds. We have the masterminds for Global From Asia VIP members, and I want to show a little, little clip of that. Um, we'll add that into the a a end of this video. We also have independent parts of that but i want to show some highlights of what we learned and what we did in the last mastermind which is members only and i hope you are interested to join us for future ones so i think that's it for this week's show i will see you in the next one we already recorded it it's gonna be in two weeks time with online banking us without having to go there without having to have a us citizenship so and some strategies and sites and other, other options for you. So I'm really excited to do that one with you next week. Until next time, thank you so much. If you're in a membership, see you at the Mastermind. If not, see you on the, the podcast in two weeks. Now let's do a recap of last this past week's Mastermind session. Take care. All right, so just, just wrapped up one hour session here. January 19, 2020. We had a nice group. We put together the FBA and dropshippers into one table today. And what we discussed was some inventory financing, some options for people based in Asia, not in the US, some companies that I know and others have used or talked about. And then we kind of went into some ways to, to start. We were talking about different ways of choosing your product and how many products to launch with, how to test, how much money to invest in which product, 
I was getting some tips from others, and and then we wrapped it up where each person said what they're going to work on until the next two weeks from now. So we got some people kind of trying different markets, trying new products, trying some new tactics, and in two weeks we'll see how they've grown. This is what it's all about. It's what we're trying to do here at the GFA VIP Mastermind, our membership at Global From Asia. It'd be great to see some people in, in here join us. So globalfromasia.com slash apply, application only. Let us know what you're interested in and hope to see you on the next one. Take care. For more info about running an international business, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.